Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Al Tillery, and I'm the director of the Center for the Study uh, of Diversity and Democracy. Uh, and welcome to the Black History Month installment of the Change Makers and the CSDD's lecture series on anti racist thought and action. Uh, we're incredibly lucky today that we're going to be in dialogue with Professor Natasha Trethaway. I'm just going to turn it over to uh, Stephanie Hicks, who has been a uh, co-organizer of the series along with uh, myself and, and Steve Adams. Uh, and so, Stephanie, I'll let you do the introductions. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are so excited to have Professor Trethaway here in our midst. Um, so I'd just like to um, give you all a little bit of background information on her. So Natasha Trethway served two terms as the 19th Poet Laureate of the United States. She is the author of five collections of poetry, including Native Guard, for which she was awarded the 2007 Pulitzer Prize, and most recently, Monument, Poems New and Selected. She's also published a book of nonfiction, Beyond Katrina, a meditation on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and a memoir, Memorial Drive which was a New York Times instant bestseller. I'm also right in the middle of that one, so please pick it up. Uh, she is the recipient of um, fellowships from the Academy of American Poets, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Beinecke Library at Yale, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. She is a fellow of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Letters. In 2017, she received the Heinz Award for Arts and Humanities. And in 2019, she was elected to the Board of Chancellors of the Academy of American Poets. Currently, she is the Board of Trustees Professor of English at Northwestern University. We are again, Immensely excited and honored to have you here with us. And Steve, take it away. Great. Um, I'd like to join um, Stephanie and Al in thanking um, Natasha for joining us today. Um, Natasha um, is sort of an old friend and a, and a new friend. Um, I know her through um, my sister-in-law, Audrey Petty, who wrote a great book that um, I may give some information about um, a little bit later, um, High Rise Stories, it's pretty amazing. Um, but Audrey and Natasha went to graduate school together. And um, I've always, you know, for a while I had always heard about her. And then in about 2009, I met her, at, you know, at Emory. And then I look up and she's here at Northwestern. And it's just wonderful to have her as a neighbor. She lives right up the street. And um, I thought it would be um, phenomenal um, during this anti-racism anti and thought in action series um, to have a chance um, to um, listen to um, Natasha share um, some readings. So Natasha will share from Memorial Drive, I'm sorry, share some from Memorial Drive and um, talk a bit about race and writing. And she may even surprise us with some poetry um, today um, since um, she's a poet. I don't know if, she, if Natasha, you think of yourself as a poet first, um, but this memoir was absolutely amazing. Um, so I guess we can start with Memorial Drive. Would you like to read from it first or give an intro? I'll sort of pass the, the mic to you now. Well, okay. um, N Natasha um, is sort of an old friend and a, and a new friend. Um, I know her through um, my sister-in-law, Audrey Petty, who wrote a great book that um, I may give some information about um, a little bit later, um, High Rise Stories, it's pretty amazing. Um, but Audrey and Natasha went to graduate school together. And um, I've always, you know, for a while I had always heard about her and then in about 2009, I met her, at, you know, at Emory. And then I look up and she's here at Northwestern and it's just wonderful to have her as a neighbor. She lives right up the street. And um, I thought it would be um, phenomenal um, during this anti-racism anti and thought in action series um, to have a chance um, to um, listen to um, Natasha share um, some readings. So Natasha will share from Memorial Drive, I'm sorry, share some from Memorial Drive 
and um, talk a bit about race and writing. And she may even surprise us with some poetry um, today um, since um, she's a poet. I don't know if, she, if Natasha, you think of yourself as a poet first, um, but this memoir was absolutely amazing. Um, so I guess we can start with Memorial Dr Drive. Would you like to read from it first or give an intro? I'll sort of pass the, mi the mic to you now. Well, thank you, um, Stephen, and thank you, Stephanie, for having me. I'm really um, honored to be here. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, and as Steve said, though I am primarily a poet, I'm going to read from my memoir, but I will also close with a poem because as I was working on Memorial Drive, some things came to me in the language of poetry, and I would have to stop, turn the page over, and compose a poem. Both impulses for me are driven by acts of memorialization and are rooted in my two existential wounds. In his memorial to William Butler Yeats, W.H. Auden wrote, Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. Likewise, my native land, my South, my Mississippi, with its brutal history of racial violence and oppression, inflicted my first wound. My deeper wound came later, and at the intersection of the two is the foundation of my concerns as a writer, the origins of my interest in and obsession with monuments and memorialization, monuments to the Confederacy and the way that certain sites and acts of commemoration serve to naturalize white supremacy, graving it into the physical landscape and the landscape of the psyche, our cultural memory, while erasing or obscuring other histories. So I'm going to read now from Memorial Drive. The last image of my mother, but for the photographs taken of her body at the crime scene, is the formal portrait made only a few months before her death. She sat for it in a mass market studio known for its competent but unremarkable pictures. Babies coaxed to laughter by hand puppets, children in stair-step formation wearing matching Christmas sweaters, all against a common backdrop. Sometimes it's a sky blue scrim that looks as if it's been brushed with a feather or an autumn scene of red and yellow leaves framing a post and rail fence. For moodier portraits, as if to convey a sense of seriousness or formal elegance, there's the plain black scrim. She was 40 years old. For the sitting, she'd chosen a long sleeve black sheath, the high collar open at the throat. She does not look at the camera, her eyes fixed at a point in the distance that seems to be just above my head, making her face as inscrutable as it always was. Her high, elegant forehead, smooth and unlined, a billboard upon which nothing is written. Nor does she smile, which makes the cleft in her chin more pronounced, her jawline softly squared above her slender neck. She sits perfectly erect without looking forced or uncomfortable. Perhaps she intended to look back on it years later and say, that's where it began, my new life. I'm struck with the thought that this is what she must have meant to do, document herself as a woman come this far, the rest of her life ahead of her. Hindsight makes me see the portrait differently now, how gloomy it is as if the photographer meant to produce something artistic rather than an ordinary studio portrait. It's as if he made of the negative space around her a frame to foreground some difficult knowledge, the dark past passed behind her, her face lit toward a future upon which her gaze is fixed. And yet, undeniably, something else is there, elegiac even then, a strange corner of light just behind her head perhaps the photographer's mistake, appearing as though a doorway has opened, a passage through which, turning, she might soon depart. Looking at it now, with all I know of what was to come, I see what else the photographer has done. He shot her like this, her black dress, black as the scrim behind her, so that, but for her face, she is in fact part of that darkness, emerging from it, as from the depths of memory. Nearly 30 years after my mother's death, I went back for the first time to the place she was murdered. 
I'd not been there since the year I turned 19, when I had to clean out her apartment, disposing of everything I could not or would not carry with me. All the furniture and household items, her clothing, her large collection of records. I kept only a few of her books, a heavy belt made of bullets, and a single plant she had loved, a Diffenbachia. Throughout my childhood, it had been my responsibility to tend it, every week, dusting and misting the upper leaves and snipping the brown lower ones. Be careful when you handle it, my mother warned. A small precaution, seemingly unnecessary, but there is a toxin in the sap of the Diffenbachia. It oozes from the leaves and the stems where they are cut. Dumb cane, the plant is called, because it can cause a temporary inability to speak. Struck dumb, we say, when fear or shock or astonishment renders us mute. Dumb grief, when the grief is not expressed in uttered words. I could not then grasp the inherent metaphor of the plant, my relationship with my mother, what it would mean that she had made its care my duty while warning me of its danger. When I left Atlanta, vowing never to return, I took with me what I had cultivated all those years, mute avoidance of my past, silence and willed amnesia buried deep in me like a root. Nor could I have anticipated then that anything would draw me back to that city, to a geography that held at every turn a reminder of a past I was determined to forget. Coming back for work, after accepting a faculty position at a university, I thought I could circumvent my former life. Until now, I've gone out of my way to avoid at least the one place I could not bear to see. To get there, I had to drive past landmarks that took me back to 1985, the county courthouse where the trials were held, the train station from which my mother traveled downtown to work, the DeKalb County Police Station at the intersection of Highway 285, the bypass loop around Metro Atlanta, and Memorial Drive, a major east-west artery once named Fair Street. It originates in the middle of the city, Memorial, and winds east from downtown, ending at Stone Mountain, the nation's largest monument to the Confederacy. A lasting metaphor for the white mind of the South, Stone Mountain rises out of the ground like the head of a submerged giant, the nostalgic dream of Southern heroism and gallantry emblazoned on its brow. In bas relief, the enormous figures of Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and Jefferson Davis. Not far from its base is the apartment we lived in that last year at the 5400 block of Memorial, number 18D. Though I knew exactly where it is, knew the landmarks leading up to it, I drove right past it first and had to double back to enter the tree-lined front gate. From there, I could see Stone Mountain in the distance, suddenly visible where memorial crests, as if to remind me what is remembered here and what is not. The last time I was here, the morning after her death, I could see the faded chalk outline of her body on the pavement, the yellow police tape still stuck to the door, the small round hole in the wall beside her bed where a single bullet a mist shot, lodged. Nothing on the landscape today bears evidence to any of that, though everything seems to carry the imprint of loss. Standing under the window to what had been my mother's bedroom, I thought of the bullet hole, so small an imprint of the event that changed forever our lives. It would have been repaired soon after, filled and painted over, and I wondered now if the building had settled more with age, the walls shifting. I've seen the depression a once covered nail head can leave when a house settles, a pock in the drywall like a wound opening from beneath the surface. That's what's drawn me back, the hidden, covered over, nearly erased. I need now to make sense of our history, to understand the tragic course upon which my mother's life was set 
and the way my own life has been shaped by that legacy. This chapter begins with an epigraph from Shakespeare's sonnet number three that reads, thou art thy mother's glass and she in thee calls back the lovely April of her prime. Another country. There is a large birthmark on the back of my thigh. Even though it has been with me over half a century, I can't recall which leg bears its dark outline and I have to look at myself backwards in a mirror to remember. Seeing it is not unlike encountering a forgotten scar, a remnant that recalls the moment of wounding. It takes me back to my early childhood, the long warm days in Mississippi when I wore shorts most of the time and the birthmark was plainly visible, not usually hidden as it is now. Though not the shape of a hand, it is the size of one in exactly the spot where if you were told to sit on your hands as my mother was, you might leave a mark. Across cultures, myths abound about the imprint a mother can make even before her child crosses the threshold of her body into the world, the way her desires or fears can be manifest, birthmarks in the shape or color of food she craved, a lock of gray hair where she tugged at her own. To stanch the cravings, they say, eat a bit of dirt or clay. To steady the hand that worries the hair, sit on it. Had my mother done any of these things, there might be a single story in my family about what my birthmark symbolizes. The only thing the elders agreed on was that it looked like a place on a map, somewhere my mother might have dreamed of, but had never been. I've often imagined her anticipating my arrival, both hopeful and anxious about the world, the particular time and place I would enter, a fierce longing taking shape inside her. In April of 1966, when I was born, my mother was a couple of months shy of her 22nd birthday. My father was out of town traveling for work, so she made the short trip from my grandmother's house to Gulfport Memorial Hospital as planned without him. On her way to the segregated ward, she could not help but take in the tenor of the day, witnessing the barrage of rebel flags lining the streets, private citizens, lawmakers, Klansmen, often one and the same, raising them in Gulfport and small towns all across Mississippi. The 26th of April that year marked the 100th anniversary of Mississippi's celebration of Confederate Memorial Day, a holiday glorifying the lost cause, the Old South, and white supremacy. And much of the fervor was also a display in opposition to recent advancements in the civil rights movement. She could not have missed the paradox of my birth on that particular day, a child of miscegenation, an interracial marriage still illegal in Mississippi and in as many as 20 other states in the nation. Sequestered on the colored floor, my mother knew the country was changing, but slowly. She had come of age in the summer of 1965, turning 21 in the wake of Bloody Sunday, the Watts riots, and years of racially motivated murders in Mississippi. Unlike my father, who'd grown up a white boy in rural Nova Scotia, free ranging, hunting and fishing in the open woods, my mother had come into being a black girl in the deep south hemmed in, bound to a world circumscribed by Jim Crow. Though my father believed in the idea of living dangerously, the adventurer's way, the necessity of taking risks, my mother had witnessed the necessity of dissembling, the art of making of, of one's face an inscrutable mask before whites who expected of blacks a servile deference. In the summer of 1955, when she was 11 years old, she'd seen what could happen to a black child in Mississippi who had not behaved as expected, stepping outside the confines of racial prescription, Emmett Till's battered remains, his destroyed face in my grandmother's copy of Jet Magazine. Even had my mother wanted to ignore the racial violence and increasing turbulence around her, my grandmother would not allow it. 
In her house, Jet lay on the coffee table next to a book of documentary photographs of the civil rights movement. Images ranging from lynchings to peaceful protests and the resilient faces of black Americans. Constant reminders of the necessity to fight for justice in a state where the reminders were increasingly unavoidable. The year before my mother met my father, civil rights activist Medgar Evers had been gunned down in his driveway in Jackson. That year, 1963, my grandmother joined a group of citizens in the Biloxi Wade Inn to protest being denied the right to use the public beaches. To mourn Evers, the protesters placed hundreds of black flags in the sand, an image my mother, watching from the seawall, would not forget. Nor would she forget hearing the news of the three civil rights activists working on the Freedom Summer Campaign to register Black voters in Mississippi. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner had been abducted and murdered in June of 1964, their bodies found two months later buried beneath the weight of an earthen berm in Neshoba County. When the news reached her, my mother was out of state on a field trip with her college theater troupe. Back home, the Ku Klux Klan had initiated its campaign of terror, and the Mississippi she returned to had grown even more frightening. That summer was a season of fires, of danger coming ever closer, flaming crosses and black churches burning all around the state. My mother and grandmother, living across the street from a church, slept less soundly then, awakening often in the night to listen. It was against that backdrop of imminence and upheaval that my parents, both college students at the time, fell in love. They met in a literature course on modern drama, and their conversations on books and theater had propelled them from the classroom out into the afternoon sunlight as they walked the campus and rolling green hills of Kentucky. When they eloped in 1965, traveling across the Ohio River into Cincinnati, where it was legal for them to be married, only my mother fully understood what this might mean for me the child she was already carrying. In letters to my father during their months apart, she was both sanguine and practical, hopeful for a changing nation, but also aware that a child she'd bring into the world would have much to learn in order to be safe. That meant I would need to understand the realities I would face, the painful oppressive facts of a place slow to accept integration, even as it was the law of the land. My father, idealistic in nature, was still naive enough to believe I could grow up as free of the burdens of race, of blackness that is, as he was. They complemented each other, as opposites do. My mother, graceful and reserved, attentive to details. My father was with his rough manners, rowdy and bookish at once, often distracted by his thoughts. It was my mother who stanched the blood on my cheek when, after watching my father shaving, I tried using his straight razor. It had been my father, absent-minded, who'd left the razor on the counter in my reach. One day, when I cut my knee in the ditch outside, revealing what appeared to be a layer of white skin underneath, I lay between them, holding their hands up side by side, asking why they weren't the same color why I matched neither of them exactly. What was I? You have the best of both worlds, they told me, not for the first time. Out in the world, alone with either of them, I was just beginning to feel a profound sense of dislocation. If I was with my father, I measured the polite responses from white people, the way they addressed him as sir or mister. My mother would be called gal, never miss or ma'am, as I had been taught was proper. So different was the treatment I received with each of them that I was unsure where or how I belonged. Only at home, the three of us together, did I feel profoundly theirs. And in that trinity of mother, father, and child, I would shut my eyes and fall asleep on the high bed between them. 
when I began to go out with both my parents outside the confines of North Gulfport to a store or the movie theater, I watched the ways white people responded to us. That my parents were beautiful would have been reason enough to stare. But in Mississippi, in the late 60s and early 70s, it had only been a few years since the beaches were integrated to comply with national law, and the schools were yet to be fully desegregated across the state. Former Governor Ross Barnett was monitoring interracial activity, and my grandmother had been on the list of people to watch ever since she tried to place my parents' 1965 wedding announcement in the local newspaper. Separation of the races was still the way of things, maintained by custom, if not upheld by law, and my parents and I met with a great deal of hostility most places we went. I could see it on the faces of the white people we encountered, how the seemingly nicer ones just shook their heads, whispering, such a cute little thing, too bad she's black. How others stared at us, sucking their teeth, Sometimes this hostility turned to outright intimidation. Someone following us out of Woolworths to the car, my mother gripping my father's arm to prevent him turning around and engaging the man behind us. Someone else driving slowly by the house, glaring at us as we sat on the front porch, a group of three or four men accosting my father on his way home from work on the docks, asking, what's wrong with you? Why you live in among the niggers? One of the few photographs I have of the three of us together is a formal portrait taken in 1969 in my grandmother's den. It was the last photograph we'd take as a family. My father sitting on a wooden armchair, my mother balanced on the arm, her long legs crossed, and me between them, puckish in a green dress. I see in the photograph now my grandmother's desire for commemoration. Most pictures we had were snapshots taken casually, but for this one, my grandmother had called the photographer. Two years after the Supreme Court had ruled in Loving v. State of Virginia that laws prohibiting interracial marriage were unconstitutional, it was as if she wanted the formality of a professional portrait to make visible the legitimacy of my parents' union, our family, in a place where we were still seen as an aberration. The photographer who came to take the portrait was a double amputee. Though my mother warned me not to stare at him, I could not resist finding a way to steal glances at the space just below his knees where his shins would have been. When he scratched the air around one of the missing limbs, I was watching him with such intense curiosity that he caught me. He must have been accustomed to the rough curiosity of children. Leaning toward me, he spoke barely above a whisper. I can still feel it, he said, even though it's gone. In the photograph, you can see my mother pressing my arm with her forefinger as if to make visible her imprint upon me. I am looking directly at the photographer toward a new idea of absence, of phantom ache knowing nothing about how potently one might come to feel it. I'm gonna stop there and read a poem. The last poem in my collection, Monument. It's after a painting by Miguel Cabrera, his portrait of St. Gertrude from 1763. Articulation. In the legend, St. Gertrude is called to write after seeing in a vision the sacred heart of Christ. Cabrera paints her among the instruments of her faith, quill, inkwell, an open book, rings on her fingers like Christ's many wounds, the heart emblazoned on her chest, the holy infant nestled there as if sunk deep in a wound. Against the dark backdrop, her face is a wafer of light. How not to see in the saint's image my mother's last portrait, 
the dark backdrop, her dress black as a habit, the bright edge of her afro ringing her face with light. And how not to recall her many wounds, ring finger shattered, her ex-husband's bullet finding her temple, lodging where her last thought lodged. Three weeks gone, my mother came to me in a dream, her body whole again, but for one perfect wound, the singular articulation of all of them, a whole center of her forehead, the size of a wafer, light pouring from it. How then could I not answer her life with mine, she who saved me with hers? And how could I not, bathed in the light of her wound, find my calling there? Setting out to write this book, I did not fully understand how inseparable my two obsessions, my two wounds are, each a side of a single coin, and that my drive as a poet toward memorialization, toward examining the intersections and contentions between public and personal history, collective memory, and willed amnesia of our shared American history, and toward erecting in words a monument to my mother is bound to the myriad implements of white supremacy and black subordination, our national domestic violence graven onto the landscape and into the American psyche. But they have long been there. On one side, my birth as a daughter of miscegenation on Confederate Memorial Day. On the other, my mother's death in the shadow of the nation's largest monument to the Confederacy on Memorial Drive. Thank you. I am um, happy to um, answer any questions that you might have. So um, thank you for um, reading both from um, Memorial Drive, which um, I loved as I, I told you before. Um, and um, sharing a bit of your poetry. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how this event has shaped um, your writing over time, and, you know, how your poetry is in, you know, is in conversation with um, this memoir. Um, also, yeah. um, I know you're passionate about things liter literary and, and talk about um, what you were trying to do in this memoir, which at points read, reads very much like a poem. Well, you know, I think to answer your question, I'm going to read a poem. Um, I mentioned at the um, beginning that while working on Memorial Drive, I often had to stop and turn the page over and um, write a poem because something was coming out uh, it, as a poem instead. And the first poem, um, that is the book, the bookend to the poem I just read at the beginning of Monument is one of those poems that came out. And it tries to respond to all of the um, insensitive and uh, frankly ridiculous things that people say about domestic violence. So this is called Imperatives for Carrying On in the Aftermath. Do not hang your head or clench your fists when even your friend, after hearing the story, says, my mother would never put up with that. Fight the urge to rattle off statistics that, more often, a woman who chooses to leave is then murdered. The hundredth time your father says, but she hated violence, why would she marry a guy like that? Don't waste your breath explaining again how abusers wait, are patient, that they don't beat you on the first date, sometimes not even the first few years of a marriage. Keep an impassive face whenever you hear, stand by your man and let go your rage when you recall those words or advice given your mother. Try to forget the first trial before she was dead when the charge was only attempted murder, 
Don't belabor the thinking or the sentence that allowed her ex-husband's release a year later or the juror who said, it's a domestic issue. They should work it out themselves. Just breathe when after you read your poems about grief, a woman asks, do you think your mother was weak for men? Learn to ignore subtext. Imagine a thought cloud above your head, dark and heavy with the words you cannot say. Let silence rain down. Remember you were told by your famous professor that you should write about something else, unburden yourself of the death of your mother and just pour your heart out in the poems. Ask yourself what's in your heart, that reliquary, blood locket and seed bed and contend with what it means. The folk saying you learned from a Korean poet in Seoul, that one does not bury the mother's body in the ground, but in the chest, or like you, you carry her corpse on your back. Thank you, Natasha. So I noticed that um, in the chat, someone was asking about um, um, who my mother's killer was. That was um, her second ex-husband, um, a troubled Vietnam veteran who had been my stepfather for 10 difficult years. She was able to get a divorce, but he continued to stalk her um, and they had been divorced nearly um, a year and a half when he finally carried out what he said he was going to do. Uh, Natasha, um, thanks again for your, just your willingness to um, share your story. I'm sure um, many um, women who have endured um, domestic violence are having their sanity confirmed um, by reading this around the world. Can you talk a little bit about the reception of this book? Um, it, it's been uh, tremendously well received, um, both I think by um, reviewers who are looking at um, the literary aspects of it, but also um, uh, for people who are struggling to, to tell their own difficult stories. Um, I see that Miriam has asked a question about um, uh, how one prepares oneself or me in particular for um, um, writing a book like this. Um, I, I'm not even sure if it's possible um, to prepare uh, to prepare yourself. I knew that I had to write it because um, with my own increasing literary uh, fame, if you will, being written about myself a lot, um, my mother tended to be mentioned uh, in stories about me as, a, as an afterthought, as this victim and this murdered woman. And um, I felt that she was sort of being diminished and even erased in some ways um, as I think the real reason that I've become a writer. And so I decided that I needed to be the one to tell her story. Um, and so I determined that I was going to do that. And yet um, it was really hard. I think I it took me about seven years to write it. And I think most of that was about trying to avoid remembering what I had tried for so long to suppress and to forget. Got it. Um, in, um, in the book, um, there were points where um, I could, I, I felt like, although you were writing about, about um, this incredibly traumatic event, it seemed like you um, were really, um, enjoying the writing process that really came, came out. Um, I do um, workshops about um, how curiosity can um, activate um, 
us in the workplace and help us to be engaged at work. And um, it, it, as I was as I was reading, it sparked this thought about like she really enjoys this process of writing. Mm -hmm. You were you were clearly um, having fun, particularly um, with the way you deployed the documentary evidence. Um, and I also noticed the the the, the poem. Um, what is evidence in native guard and the, the way that those two, I'm just fascinated by how um, this event um, has shaped your work over time. Well, um, you know, um, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote that poems are records of the best and happiest times and the happiest and best minds. And that's always been true for me. The, the, the act of making something, whether it is um, in the language of poetry or the language of lyrical and poetic prose um, with the rhythms of syntax um, and figurative language that can make the mind leap to a new apprehension of things. It is indeed pure pleasure, even when writing about some of the most difficult things, because the act of making art, of course, is generative. Um, it is an act of, of, of hope because it says, I'm still here, I've survived this, and I can make um, beauty out of something so terrible. Shelley also said that poetry is the mirror that makes beautiful that which is distorted. And that's what I feel like in the process of writing. I don't wanna be completely selfish. There are definitely questions in, um, the chat. Um, I do. I do want to ask one last thing, though. Um, as um, an undergraduate, I was um, a member and then later president of a group called Black Men for the Eradication of Sexism. And we were doing our own work on addressing um, a system of oppression that um, we as men um, benefited from. Um, and you know, our thinking was that um, we couldn't end it um, without addressing those issues within, our, within ourselves. Um, what um, I felt like this was one of, you know, I now think of this book as a, as a sort of a feminist text. Um, and um, I feel like I learned more about what's needed for, um, you know, ending and addressing patriarchy. Um, I learned more in this book <laughs> than in many other texts, um, not to diminish those by bell hooks or Audre Lorde, et, et cetera. Um, I'm just wondering, um, about your um, sort of the statements that you're, you know, what statements are you trying to make about um, gender and violence um, and violence against black women in particular? You know, there's a, a, a moment in the book um, in which I, I come home from school after I've just been um, appointed to the newspaper staff. I've also um, written a short story that uh, got me um, membership in the, Literary Society and on the Literary Journal, Quill and Scroll. I am excited about the short stories I'm reading and I can't wait to tell my mother this. So instead of waiting for a moment when I can get her alone so as not to enrage my stepfather um, um, with his jealousy, I blurt out at the dinner table, I'm gonna be a writer. And um, he just, you know, sort of says, you're not gonna do any of that. And my mother at that moment, I can see, you know, how her fist sort of clenches around her fork and she clenches her teeth and she says, she will do whatever she wants. Because even as she was facing um, the threat of violence from him. She wasn't going to let him destroy me too. And I remember thinking, she's gonna be beaten for that because she did that. But it was more important for her to make sure that nothing was going to stand in the way of her daughter becoming who I wanted to be. Um, I just, uh, I noticed another question here. Um, someone asked anything to say about your father as it relates to the death of your mother. 
I love answering things with poems because then I can I can stop weeping and just get into my performance mode, which is a little little easier. So my father was also a poet. He was my first professor, and um, this is a poem uh, written uh, after him. Uh, it it sort of takes a first line, uh, idea of a first line of one of his poems and goes from there. It's called Reach. Right off, I hear him singing, the strings of his old guitar hymning the darkness as before. Late nights on the front porch, the mountains across the valley blurred to outline. We are at it again father and daughter deep in our cups, rehearsing the long years between us. In the distance, I hear the foghorn call of bullfrogs, envoys from the river of lamentation my father is determined to cross. Already, I know where this is headed. How many times has the night turned toward regret? My father saying, if only I'd been a better husband, she'd be alive today, saying Gwen and I would get back together if she were alive. It's the same old song. He is Orpheus trying to bring her back with the music of his words, lines of a poem drifting now into my dream. Picking the first chords, my father leans into the neck of the guitar, rolls his shoulders, until he's lost in it, the song carrying him across the porch and down into the damp grass. Even asleep, I know where he is going. I cannot call him back. Through the valley, the blacktop winds like a river and he is stepping into it, walking now toward the other side where she waits, my mother, just out of reach. Thank you, Natasha. Um, would you like to um, choose another? Yeah, I'm looking at some questions. Um, hmm. Oh, um, someone writes about um, me mentioning that famous professor in a poem I read who recommended that I write about something else um, and wanting to know what I tell my students about writing. Um, let me tell the full story. Uh, the whole story is actually not in the poem. In the poem, I, I mentioned that this uh, famous professor of mine told me um, to um, write, unburden myself of the death of my mother and um, just pour my heart out in the poems. The full statement that he made to me was, unburden yourself of being black, unburden yourself of the death of your mother and uh, write about the situation in Northern Ireland. He was not interested in what I had to say or what I had to write. And so instead he was telling me to write about something else. What I tell my students um, is something uh, that John Edgar Wideman, who was also a professor of mine said to me that you have to write about what you have to write about. And also the late poet Phil Levine said, I write what is given me to write. And so I believe that all of us have those existential wounds. We all have something um, that is ours alone that has given us to write. The trick is to find it, to find that wellspring of your art. Um, Federico Garcia Lorca talks about the idea of duende and he writes that the duende must be summoned from the furthest habitations of the blood. The duende being the kind of angel or demon that arouses in us an awareness of, of death and the possibility of transformation. I had that at an early age, I think, losing my mother. But I think that there are ways that we are made aware of that, that we can all, all summon from the furthest habitations of the blood. I'm going to, um, Natasha, thank you. Um, um, this is so wonderful and I'm, I'm so moved right now. Um, I want to give up just a little bit of my time. I'm sure the showrunners are like, what are you doing, Steve? But maybe we can answer one more question. 
Okay, so let's see. Uh, oh goodness, uh, these are such good questions. Um, so, um, okay, so a lot of you just have um, uh, basic questions about sort of what happened. And uh, I recommend to those of you with those questions to read the book. How about that? <laughs> Otherwise, um, yeah, you can also Google those. So I'm gonna try to deal with some other um, some other questions. Someone asked about um, my career in poetry and academe, which are um, neither neither of which are traditionally diverse spaces. In fact, there was an article today about higher education failing Black Americans in the Midwest. Do you feel a responsibility to open these spaces to African American poets and scholars? How do you navigate this role? Are you optimistic that there will be more spaces for diverse poets and scholars in the future? Um, absolutely. You know, um, two great poets, uh, Toy Derricotte and Cornelius Eady, back in 1998, I think, started the Kave Kahnem Foundation. And at, at the time, Kave Kahnem was a foundation to nurture um, the work of Black poets. And they started holding workshops. They also um, started a book prize uh, in order to publish the work of Black poets who might not be getting a fair glimpse by editors in the mainstream. I was the first winner of the Kave Kahnem Poetry Prize chosen by former uh, Pulitzer Prize winner and US Poet Laureate Rita Dove. Since then, um, as you know, I went on to win the Pulitzer Prize. Since the foundation of Kave Kahnem, there have been, what, <laughs> Uh, five more Pulitzer Prize winners, uh, Black Pul Pulitzer Prize winners since then. Let me make sure I'm counting right. So there's me um, in, in 2007, then Tracy K. Smith, then Gregory Pardlow, then Tyann Bajess, now uh, um, Jericho Brown, my former colleague at uh, Emory University. So in, in before me, I was number four, and you know Gwendolyn Brooks was the first, there had been so many years where we were not there. And all of a sudden we're there again and again. The most interesting works being published these days are black by black and other of color poets in this country um, or people who are othered in so many other ways are coming up with the most interesting work that more people are wanting to read because I think we've been in this nation really hungry for what certain kinds of writers have to say that we have not seen. Um, and so I think the doors are, have been kicked open. And um, now that they're open and we have a chance to see the rich Renaissance in American literature, they're only gonna continue to open. Natasha, thank you um, for that wonderful answer. I wish we had time, you know, more time. Um, but at this point in the program, one of the things we do in this series is, um, I'm gonna share my screen now, um, share um, homework. Again, this is um, a series inspired by the Changemakers program. And um, we in Changemakers did intentional work um, to create transformation around diversity and inclusion issues on campus. And so, um, so um, I'll just jump to the homework um, for this time. Um, and so the homework theme this month is um, Black writers um, have been trying to tell us. Black writers have been trying to tell us. Um, I think Natasha is one of those writers. And um, so the first thing um, that we're asking is that you finish or read Memorial Drive um, as homework. And the second thing is um, Professor um, Trethaway recommended um, two books, and um, they are um, The Fire This Time, edited by Jessam Ward, and um, African American po Poetry, 200 Years of Struggle and Song, um, edited by um, Ke Kevin Young, her former colleague at Emory, and um, former head of the Schomburg, who's also at the African American 
um, Museum of Afri African American History now. Add those to your library and read them after Black History Month. Um, this, uh, um, this is not the only time of year where we can focus on um, the Black experience. Um, so that's the homework this time around. And um, save the date for um, the next event which, event, which is March 31st at noon. And the topic will be Black, fem Black feminism, white feminism, and anti-racism. So please join me um, in thanking Natasha um, for um, gifting her time to us and, um, you know, just send some virtual vibes because I know that the Zoom is locked down. Um, thank you so much. So I'm going to start just because I feel like, Al, you have some very profound words for us and I'm not going <laughs> to you. So Natasha, first of all, so one of the, the um, attendees said that they were weeping with you and I was sitting here doing the was. thing. <laughs> it was moving. Thank you. So powerful and impactful. I couldn't send you the amount of thanks that you deserve. Thank you, Thank you so much for being here and blessing us with your beautiful words. Yeah, and I, I just want to second that. I don't think my words can get anywhere near what Stephanie was saying, but I, I was weeping with you, which is part of why I had my camera off, but <laughs> uh, also weeping in part because I'm a child of uh, the, the, the desegregating Jim Crow South as well, Virginia, Georgia, Alabama. And I remember the threat of violence everywhere uh, as a young boy. And so just the fact, as, as a person that wasn't navigating in a sort of interracial family. So I can only imagine uh, you know, what your context was like. And thank you so much for sharing uh, your stories with us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, you guys. Sure. And to our audience, thank you for you all who are still here. We hope to see you all on March 31st, correct, Steve? Yep, yep March right. 31st. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your days. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you.